Yes, and let me welcome uh, uh, Pratik Chaudhary from University of Pennsylvania, who will be delivering three lectures on the principles of deep learning. There is a teaching material already uploaded on the website, and there will be more over the next uh, lectures. Thank you, Pratik, please. Okay, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to meet you. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, I cannot travel at the moment. Um, but uh, over the next three days, uh, I would like to uh, tell you about some uh, ideas in uh, what is called deep learning. Uh, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. Uh, and uh, for those of you who may not have heard about this, uh, the uh, the very zoomed out version of thinking about this is uh, uh, when people began to uh, think about how to make machines learn in the sense that uh, we know that the biological brain learns. It looks at patterns of all things around us and then makes inferences when it sees new kinds, uh, new data that is similar to the data that is on the past. This is what one would uh, define as learning. Uh, New, deep neural networks, uh, uh, which is what people call them, are machine learning models uh, or artificial learning models that are inspired from how the human brain learns. They consist of things like neurons uh, or mathematical abstractions of neurons. And uh, there, is a, there is a long history of studying these kinds of learning machines. And so we'll talk a little bit about the history first. Uh, and then I'll tell you um, a lot of uh, how, um, concepts and ideas in how people think about deep learning today. Uh, this will be the content of the first talk, uh, first lecture. The next two lectures will be more of a research lectures where we'll talk about some uh, um, more uh, modern ideas or cutting edge ideas on how deep networks work or when they do not work, when they work, etc. If you go to the ICTP website, I have uploaded these notes. So this is a PDF. Uh, it is a rather long PDF. So do not be scared. It's not as if I'm going to go through the entire PDF in uh, one and a half hour. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll do it in bits and parts. Uh, there is also uh, three Jupyter notebooks uh, and we will go through those notebooks uh, very briefly at the end of the class to give you some kind of uh, uh, appreciation for how code in deep learning looks like uh, if you have never done deep learning before. So uh, let us begin. I, I, I call this uh, series of lectures very boldly principles of deep learning, but it's a little bit of an oxymoron because uh, deep learning is a very new field and uh, there is no uh, understanding or there is not so much uh, agreement on what the principles of deep learning uh, should look like. So this is my attempt, a uh, uh, long standing program at this point of time uh, to uh, lay down some uh, uh, principles for how we should think about deep networks. Okay, uh, just to tell you uh, my personal perspective on what learning means, uh, uh, let us take a few minutes to uh, set up the spiritual uh, facade. Uh, what is intelligence? Well, uh, each of us uh, would define intelligence in very different ways. Um, uh, but most of us will agree that uh, humans are intelligent. All of us are clearly intelligent. That is how we define ourselves to be humans. All of you will also agree that a dog is a tiny bit less intelligent than human beings. Uh, it cannot do all the things. It cannot do integrals. Uh, but it can do something. It can fetch a fris frisbee when you throw it, um, and that counts for something. Right? Uh, so it can walk, it can sense, it can smell. Uh, an ant uh, is a tiny bit less intelligent than a dog. Uh, ants can affect the world around them in uh, lesser ways than uh, dogs or human beings. Uh, but they can do things. They can work in communities. They can achieve uh, things that are much larger than their physical capabilities by uh, using their environment wisely. And this is the kind of intelligence that these uh, biological organisms uh, have. Now, when you if you define intelligence this broadly, then there is one goal for what it means to be intelligent that stands stark in front of us. Uh, and that I would argue is just survival. So 
if you are an uh, entity that would seek that that needs to survive and that needs to survive in spite of changes in the environment in spite of things that you may not be suited to deal with optimally then you require some intelligence to adapt and this is how we would like to think of uh, intelligence well, this is biological intelligence uh, and many things in nature uh, have uh, flavors of such intelligence. Things can gather food, things can find mates, uh, can reproduce, uh, and at the end of the day, survive uh, uh, with respect to changes in the environment. Uh, there are also lesser beings, so let's say plants, uh, which would be a tiny bit less intelligent. They cannot move around, uh, but they can do certain rudimentary things. You, if you could have a potted plant on your desk, uh, it moves towards the window um, over uh, uh, a few months. And that is a notion of it's trying to seek out more nutrients on the environment. Right? Uh, and just as a way to uh, uh, begin the lecture, I wanted to give you an example of this plant. Uh, this is what is called a tunicate. Uh, tunicates are uh, plants uh, that live on the ocean floor. Uh, and when they're born, uh, they're actually animals. So they have a nervous system of ganglion cells uh, and uh, they crawl around on the ocean floor until they find a nice big fat piece of rock with a lot of moss on it. Um, and once this plant finds this nutritious rock, uh, it goes there and then it digests its own brain uh, because it has no need for that brain anymore. And after that, it is vulnerable to its surroundings. So it grows this thing, a uh, tunic around it uh, to protect itself from its environment. And at that point, it becomes much more like a usual plant that we know on the surface of the uh, earth. Okay. Uh, I usually have this picture here uh, as a, a metaphor for professors. Uh, they are all very smart when they are young and then they grow old and then they start, uh, you stop using their brain uh, too much. I can make these kinds of jokes because I am still too young. Uh, but this is, this is one notion of intelligence which uh, morphs through its lifetime. It ceases to be uh, uh, a walking uh, and uh, acting animal and becomes more vegetative. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is my, this is the way I would like to think of intelligence. And when you define it like this, uh, things like a chess playing program or AlphaGo. AlphaGo is a machine that a company called DeepMind made. DeepMind is uh, owned by Google now, and they're a company based in London. Uh, that works on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, they created this machine to play Go. Okay, uh, Go is a game much like chess. Uh, it is very popular in East Asia. Uh, and after they made this machine, I don't want to show the video. You can sh uh, look at this video later. Uh, after they made this machine, uh, they had this very famous match with a Korean Go champion uh, called Lee Sedol. Uh, and uh, it uh, defeated Lisa Doll in the first three matches. Uh, this is a very beautiful movie. You can find it on Netflix to watch of, uh, of their process of developing it and then uh, all the little tricks that they did to make sure that it performs well, et cetera. And it was a very capable machine that could defeat uh, uh, this uh, human player who was widely regarded to be among the best ones uh, uh, around. Uh, and if you think about, if, if, if you look at the movie, you will see that there's a little scene where an American Go champion uh, is talking about how a mere human, the best human at Go, uh, can possibly defeat a machine as good as AlphaGo. And he says this, uh, if you want to defeat a chess playing program or a Go playing program, all you have to do is pull the plug. The machine cannot play anymore and you win by default. Uh, this is a very trite statement, but it has a nugget of uh, uh, truth. Uh, machines cannot fight back, and then the, and and this kind of intelligence is very narrow in how it interacts with the world. It can do one task, which is playing chess in a very very uh, good way, but it cannot do any other task, and it certainly cannot do it um, uh, do the diversity of tasks that humans can. So, a key indicator of intelligence, and this is how I define it as a roboticist is the ability to move around and affect the world around you. Uh, and as soon as we say this, as soon as we uh, define intelligence like this, the ability to move, up, move around and survive the world, uh, a few things become uh, very integral to this definition. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, the first one that I would call is uh, perception. Uh, perception is the ability to see uh, things in the environment. And this comes from various things. It comes from different sensors. Uh, we have many sensors, eyes, ears, nose, smell, uh, and, and touch. Uh, and different uh, intelligent beings will have different kinds of sensors. Once you obtain information from the sensors about your environment, you would like to do something to this information. You would like to crunch it. And so cognition is the way that you crunch information of your surroundings. But then you have to do something with this information. Otherwise, you cannot move. Otherwise, you cannot affect the world around you. And that is what I would call as action. Action is the ability to affect things. Action is the ability to move around. And these three, they act in unison. It is not a feed forward sequential decision making process in the sense that if you just watch something on the video, you think about it and then you act, then you will not be a very intelligent agent because if you if you think about how you behave when you lose your phone or you have uh, trying to search for the keys before leaving the house, you actively take actions that will give you new kinds of information. And you once you take the action, uh, in, uh, once you have a certain element uh, kind of information, you know what action to take uh, based on uh, based on this. So there is a loop that connects perception, cognition, and action, and the. The interconnectedness of this loop is central to how you and I uh, live in the in the physical world. These series of lectures are not going to focus on the entire loop. Uh, there is many ways of thinking about this. People in computer vision will primarily deal about this. People, people in control theory would deal about the third part of this loop. What we will think about is a very narrow problem, which is cognition or which is intelligence. And uh, we are not going to worry about where the data comes from. We are not going to worry so much about how to use the data. We are going only going to make predictions on this data. And we are going to define some uh, principles for how we should crunch information that comes from our sensors to make decisions without ever actually checking how good these decisions are, roughly speaking. OK? So here is the goal of the following lectures. Uh, the goal of learning or goal of machine learning to be more specific is to crunch past data and build a prior for what you may see in the future. It is very crucial to realize that all that learning can do or to, to, to uh, have it firm in your mind that all that learning can do is build a prior. The kind of actions that you take will necessarily depend on what you have perceived at the very moment. So we should always think of learning as a way to summarize past data and make the process of taking actions more efficient. Uh, Eugenio gave a talk on inference. If you should think of learning as enabling inference rather than replacing inference. A chess playing program necessarily uses the move of the opponent, the current move of the opponent to take the next move, right? It would be a very bad program if it simply used the statistical distribution of all the moves that people have played in the 17th move of the game and played that move to win the game. That wouldn't work very well, okay? So you should never think of a, a machine learning model as something that, uh, that takes a data set from a hard disk and then makes predictions. This is how we uh, like to formalize it sometimes, but that is not enough if you want to think of a real problem, if you want to think of a real system that makes predictions and takes actions. We always have to think of inference in addition to learning. Learning is simply summarization of past data, and then inference is the process that uses a prior to actually take the actions. The better you are at crunching past data, the less work you'll have to do at inference time, uh, and the better actions you will get. Okay. So, any questions or any comments? Okay. Uh, with this uh, 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 motivation, uh, so speaking, uh, let me give you a very, very, very brisk uh, summary uh, of how people began to think of these ideas. Uh, the way I am thinking, uh, the way uh, I introduced it, uh, these ideas roughly began in the early 40s. Uh, so these are two gentlemen. This is Warren McCulloch, uh, who was a neuroscientist, and this is Walter Pitts, who was a logician. Uh, uh, Walter Pitts was in Chicago. Warren McCulloch was in uh, MIT. 
uh, for some time. Uh, they together built uh, what we would call the first abstraction of how a biological neuron would work. A biological neuron is a complicated thing. It has dendrites and axon and synapses, and it interacts with any, uh, neurons around it in complicated ways using biochemical reactions. One very, very coarse way of abstracting away all these computations that are performed by uh, our neurons in the uh, biological brain is to imagine that it's a machine that has some inputs. Let's say X1, X2, X3 to Xn are all the pixels of the image that you are trying to process. These are all the inputs that you get. You compute some function of these inputs. Uh, it could be a complicated function. It could be a simple function that is just your choice. And you predict some output. It could be a complicated output. It could be simply zero or one, whether or not there is an orange in this image or not, okay? Uh, this is, as you can appreciate, a very coarse abstraction of how a biological neuron works. And this is what uh, uh, Maculoch and Pitts uh, discussed in this paper, which many would call the beginning of thinking about neural networks. They wanted to imagine how uh, we can build systems, uh, we, we can build, uh, build artificial systems that capture the computations in the brain. Yeah. Um, around the same time, uh, Alan Turing was also thinking about very similar things. And he also wanted to uh, capture, to summarize uh, the uh, binary nature of the neuron in the brain, whether it fires or whether it does not fire after receiving certain stimuli from its nearby neurons. He wanted to capture these principles into uh, more abstract uh, uh, notions of computation uh, that happened. This was after he had developed ideas on computation that was late uh, 30s. This was roughly early 40s. Uh, and the neurons that MacKillock and Pitts developed or uh, Alan Turing developed, you can read these papers to know more, are essentially uh, containing all the germs uh, of the neurons that we use today. Uh, for artificial learning. The, the, the kind of neurons that we use in artificial learning hasn't changed very much. Of course, uh, neuroscience has advanced uh, quite a bit over the last uh, eight decades uh, since this happened in understanding how the biological neuron can be modeled, can be uh, understood, can, can dig deeper into uh, the little channels that open up when these neurons communicate with each other. Uh, but at the mathematical level, we haven't started playing too much with these models yet. Okay. Uh, uh, around the same time uh, in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Norbert Wiener, who was a mathematician, uh, was trying to think about uh, the, uh, the kind of words that I said at the beginning of the lecture. And people would call this cybernetics, which is a word that he coined uh, to, to, uh, to capture the notion that an intelligent agent is something that has sensors that create, that takes actions and performs some computation as to how it would take those actions based on the inputs. Okay. So these are the, these are the four uh, interesting people if you want to read like super old stuff in neural networks. Uh, um, uh, Levine, uh, McKillock, uh, and then this is Gray Walter from England who made some of the first few robots uh, uh, that could do some autonomous behaviors, uh, uh, and then this should be uh, this is pitch. Okay, uh, well that is the super early era. Uh, um, I would like to now move to the sixties. In the sixties, uh, uh, or, or uh, let's say in the late forties or early fifties, uh, Claude Shannon, uh, who uh, was a mathematician. Uh, developed what is called what we know today as uh, as information theory, and he essentially began the field. Uh, and the premise of information theory for us, uh, when we think about learning, uh, is slightly different from how Shannon was thinking or how communication theory would think. Uh, in communication theory, uh, you would like to say that I have a piece of data. I would like to summarize or encode this piece of data and then add some redundancy and then transmit it across a channel. Uh, this channel is a physical thing. The wireless signal that is uh, uh, connecting your phone to the Wi-Fi has disturbances that come from other phones connecting to the same Wi-Fi and then EM radiation from the lab above and many other things. 
uh, and whatever way you use to encode your message has to be resilient to these disturbances. So Shannon was interested in principles that define how much I can encode things and how well I can transmit things, how well I can uh, use the uh, channel, so speaking, uh, to transmit information from one place to the other, from the source to the destination. In machine learning, we think about this in a slightly different way. Uh, we are not so much interested in simply encoding data. We are interested in encoding data for a specific purpose. Uh, we would like to take uh, signals that consist of images, text, uh, sounds, etc., uh, which are roughly speaking continuous signals, um, and uh, understand from them certain abstract concepts. Uh, and you can give names to these concepts, uh, ideas, uh, objects, categories, phonemes, uh, uh, call it what you will. Uh, these are discrete objects. Why do we want these discrete objects? Well, we would like to do manipulations with them. We would like to say how many dogs there are in this scene, uh, what is the dog standing on, uh, uh, etc. And we would like to do logical in make logical inferences upon such uh, data. Okay, so uh, we in machine learning are necessarily interested in throwing away a lot of redundant information from the data in order to reach this more abstract uh, inferences about the images, okay? And in that sense, it is a lit little different from how classical information theory thinks about classical information Information theory does not like to throw away stuff because why would you throw away uh, by choice? Uh, all you, you what, what you want to do is protect yourself from the disturbances that can happen in the channel and make and get a lot of redundancy. We in learning want to throw away stuff because we don't want uh, the fact that a dog is a dog to depend on whether or not it is standing on the grass or whether it is standing on the beach or whether it is catching a frisbee. We want the concept dog to be encoded in our representation and the rest of it would be a nuisance to this representation. Okay, so this is how we will think about representation learning. Uh, and you will see more in the coming lectures. Uh, the first, uh, I would argue, a uh, computational way of building um, a neural network uh, was uh, done by uh, Frank Rosenblatt in the late 50s at Cornell and a Navy lab. And uh, what he built, uh, you can read this very beautiful article on it, uh, is a five ton machine uh, that could perform a very simple task. It could distinguish between punch cards that are punch left and punch cards that are punch right. Now, all of us, uh, are way too young to ever have seen a punch card, but it's a punch card the size of a credit card, slightly bigger, I think, uh, with holes, uh, and with, uh, which which is used for uh, performing certain kinds of computations. The holes encode what is the in uh, what what datum is written on that card. Okay, and uh, the, uh, the the same uh, abstract model of a neuron that we saw for MacKillock and Pitts is what uh, uh, Frank Rosenblatt coded up. Uh, X1 to XD, think of it as inputs, uh, input pixels. Uh, you multiply them by some learned weights. Uh, this should be WD, by some learned weights. These are parameters of your neuron. Uh, and this is just one particular way of writing down the model of a neuron. It's a linear model. Um, and then you apply a sign function. A sign function is something that takes, in, takes its argument returns a one if it is positive, returns a minus one if it is negative. And at the end of the day, this entire function, I'm using it just to not denote some notation at this point, uh, is a linear operation on the inputs X using the parameters W. Uh, and we will call it like this. It returns a Boolean at the end of the day if you're interested in classification. So if you wanted this machine to say, oranges versus apples, then oranges would be plus one, apples would be minus one, and then X would be the image and the, all the pixels in the image, okay? And we would find the best W that is good at predicting apples and oranges correctly over a bunch of data that we obtained uh, for uh, images and the corresponding ground truth labels, okay? Uh, now, this is a linear model. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the uh, 60s, uh, Marvin Minsky, who was a famous uh, artificial intelligence professor at MIT and Seymour Pepper, uh, they began to study this and they said, oh, we know that this is a linear model, so it cannot obviously uh, solve problems that are like this. Uh, 
if you wanted to uh, classify this problem, this is the XOR problem. There does not exist a hyperplane or a straight line that splits this cleanly, which is what we are fitting here at the end of the day. Uh, and this clearly indicates limitations of such linear models. Uh, somehow it's a quirk of history that uh, while they were simply saying that uh, saying this as a uh, as a fact and not necessarily uh, 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 dissing upon the perceptron, uh, other people around them understood this as an obvious limitation for what would be called the connectionist approach, which is a way of writing down these models of artificial neurons and then doing computations with them. And so basically people began to, uh, people essentially stopped working on uh, neural networks in the late 60s. And then there was a heyday of uh, artificial intelligence in the 70s where people were using logic and motion planning and stuff like this to uh, say or build intelligent behaviors. Okay. Um, essentially at the, uh, at the end of 80s, in the late 80s, uh, deep learning became uh, 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 had a big resurgence, and it is quite similar to what we see today. Uh, uh, everyone was working on this. Uh, everyone was very excited about this, uh, primarily because uh, uh, Rumel Hart and Hinton rediscovered backpropagation. They rediscovered it because it had already been discovered about a good twenty years ago in Japan. Uh, they didn't know it so much. Uh, but uh, people could train, roughly speaking, neural networks that are multiple layers in the late 80s and the early 90s. Now, at the same time, uh, 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 people began to understand ideas from neuroscience, uh, uh, Hubel and Wiesel's work in the 60s, and began to capture these understandings of how the human brain is structured into artificial neural networks. One big innovation of this kind was a convolutional neural network. So just like we had a linear function of the that connects inputs and outputs, and uh, you apply a sign to it, a convolutional neural a convolutional neuron uh, would uh, uh, convolve W with X and return some uh, uh, summarization of this uh, convolution uh, vector. Okay, uh, convolutional neural networks were created because people knew that uh, uh, convolutional filters can give you. Uh, similar features that uh, that you see in the visual cortex, and so Neocogitron is probably one of the more famous models. Uh, and Jan LeCun, uh, who is a professor in NYU, uh, we know uh, he built some of the first good convolutional networks in the early nineties. Okay. Uh, now again, like uh, uh, essentially, uh, uh, if you if you talk to some of the older folks uh, working on neural networks, uh, they'll tell you that in the mid nineties. Uh, it was uh, uh, it was let's say appreciated that neural networks did work well as well as any other machine learning model. It was very difficult to use them. It was extremely challenging for people who did not know what deep learning is or what neural networks is to get good results. So Jan LeCun would get great results on uh, with a uh, convolution network and nobody else would because he was good at using them. And uh, that don't help, right? So uh, you need models that many people can use well to solve their own problems. And that is why models like support vector machines or decision forest became so popular because they were very straightforward models that did not require you to think very much or do very much to solve a new problem. And they worked quite well, maybe not as well as the best neural network even back then, but they did work quite well. Uh, so in some sense, uh, we will look at a library called PyTorch in a bit. Uh, but we should give equal credit uh, to all these libraries which popularized deep learning in the mid 2010s uh, and made it so easy to use that everyone in this room can be uh, can run a small neural network in a couple of days without having to unnecessarily do a PhD in deep learning. Okay, uh, so they deserve. Uh, there's a lot of encapsulation of ideas or complex ideas that is happening in these libraries. And the goal of these lectures is to give us the ability to dig deeper into the libraries than what the syntax allows us to understand. Okay, So these libraries are very complicated. And what we are going to try to do is understand some of the uh, moving parts so that we become better at using these models, not just uh, uh, can use these models. Okay. Uh, the, the watershed moment uh, that uh, leads us to today 
uh, is uh, uh, is uh, 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 in the summer of uh, 2012. Uh, uh, there was a competition called ImageNet uh, back in the day. And uh, this is a competition where you are required to classify about 1.3 million images. Uh, these are images taken from a website called Flickr, which people might know or but might not know also. Uh, uh, and it has, uh, it, these are images, uh, uh, a large number of images, 1.3 million is a pretty large number. So if you save it on your hard disk, it will require about 50 gigs, roughly speaking, to save this, uh, of 1,000 different classes. Now, these classes are like uh, different kinds of dogs. There is about 118 different breeds of dogs, some, most of which uh, uh, I do not know. Uh, then there will be different cars, there will be uh, different pl uh, planes and many other things that we see um, that are both man-made and that are both naturally occurring objects. Okay. Uh, the goal of this competition or the reason they had this competition was to build a machine learning model that could classify this data set as well as they, uh, one can. Uh, and until about 2011, the best methods, which were essentially large ensembles of random forest, if you know what those are, uh, would get something like a 25% error with a lot of grief. These were large complex systems. Uh, in the summer of 2012, uh, Jeff Hinton, along with a few students in his group at the time, uh, they built a convolutional neural network that dropped this error from 25 to 15.3. Uh, to give you an appreciation for why this was important, uh, it feels pretty uh, silly, uh, these computer scientists talking about all their numbers uh, and percentages. Um, but in the five years or so before uh, 2012, this number had come down from 30% to 25%. And so in one year uh, or in, uh, in the next iteration of the competition, they just decreased to 15. And in the successive years in, uh, after that, this number is all down all the way to like three or four now, which is pretty crazy. Okay. Uh, so that is what got everyone's attention. And that is when people realize, aha, there might be something that these deep networks are good at, uh, image classification specifically, uh, we, we, should, we should work on them. Uh, and the reason uh, for this uh, success is roughly speaking, uh, the availability of large GPUs. Uh, GPUs were becoming very popular uh, or very powerful in the mid-2010s. Uh, um, the shader cores were being refashioned to, to perform some computations because of a lot of parallel threads. Uh, this is, roughly speaking, the availability of GPUs uh, and uh, nice data sets. So ImageNet did not exist in the early 90s, so you would never know that a neural network works well even if uh, you had one uh, on, uh, you, you could train one. Uh, GPUs did not exist in the early 90s, so you wouldn't be able to train one to begin with. And so these two things, roughly speaking, led to this uh, modern version of deep learning that we'll look at next. Uh, the algorithms that we are using to train these networks, uh, the understanding that we have gleaned uh, as to how best we can build these models is not that different. Uh, it is basically the same ideas that we had in the 90s uh, uh, put on steroids uh, because now we have uh, access to better computation. So we can do a more precise experience to understand which ideas have worked well, which ideas do not work well. But essentially, they are the same ideas. Okay. Is that, is the, is that okay? Uh, any questions before we go to the technical stuff? Questions? Yes. Guido? Oh, okay. No, please go ahead. Pratik. Okay, cool. Thank you. So uh, hopefully that will give you some pointers to uh, as to what to read next. Uh, let us begin uh, the, uh, formalizing or uh, or at least writing down what a neural network is, the way we think of it today. And uh, and this might be repetitive for some people who have uh, seen machine learning before, but let me say it anyway in brief. Uh, in machine learning, we are interested in solving problems of the following kind. Uh, you have inputs X and you're making predictions Y. We always use this notation. Uh, and uh, nature gives us some ground truth predictions. It could be objects that are annotated in images by a group of people and those would be your ground truth 
it could be an experiment that you designed uh, where you uh, uh, took a, a, a slice and a slice of, of a cell and then put it under a microscope and stained it in different ways to say that these are the bad cells and these are the good cells. Uh, that would be why it could be the different uh, phonemes that you have when you uh, a, a listen to an audio signal, many different kinds of things. But the 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 uh, structure in which that we are, we are going to work in is uh, always imagine that someone else gives you the ground truth labels and our job as a machine learning model or a machine learning uh, researcher or user is to build a machine that can predict y accurately given new inputs x okay uh, when i why, why do i say new inputs uh, we are going to have access to a data set uh, this data set comes with a promise it comes with the promise that all the inputs and the outputs are drawn from the same distribution. So P is a joint distribution of X and Y. This is how we classically formalize things. Uh, and given that they're from the same probability distribution, I'm going to ask you for 10 N samples. This will be a part of my training data set. I will do whatever I want to these N samples. I can remember them as a hash map. I can build a model that uh, predicts why on these uh, input images, but that is not what I want to do at the end of the day. I want to make predictions on new data, not this data. Okay, this is what I have to work with, and I exp I'm expected to do well on new data. Okay, uh, and as I said, the task in machine learning is to do well on new data, and just to appreciate why this is interesting or difficult, uh, imagine that I give you images uh, of size 100 cross 100. And then within every image, uh, there is, a, let's say, an, ap uh, um, uh, an apple okay, uh, or an orange. Uh, if I give you 50 images, this is 50 times 100 plus 100 pixels, uh, RGB pixels. So they take values. Uh, they take these many different values. Every one of these 10,000 pixels takes 255, 256 cube values. Uh, okay, uh, You can build many. Uh, uh, ways you can develop many ways to take ima an image like this and predict correctly the output of every one of these 50 images uh, i have mentioned one here but uh, in in words you can simply create a hash map uh, and say if so and so set of pixels have so and so values then it's an orange if uh, so and so other set of pixels have so and so other values then it is definitely not an orange uh, when we were in high school, we built, uh, most of us might have built something that says, if there is a large patch of orange color, then I could I call it an orange in this image. If not, I could, do not call it an orange. And this would be the slightly more grown up version of that same idea. But the moral of the story that I want to say is that uh, given a data set like this, given this much information, there exists a way to predict perfectly the labels Y for each one of these images. It can be called a hash map. You can simply memorize it. Every time you get a new image, you would compare it, put it in your hash map, and then uh, try to guess the answer that is lying, uh, that is stored in the hash map. This doesn't help us very much because using this kind of a hash map, you can get perfect accuracy on the training data set. Uh, but you will be extremely bad at predicting new images. So the the, the point to understand here is that designing a predictor that does well on the training data set is trivial. That is not what we want to do. We want to build predictors that can generalize to new data outside uh, the training data set. Yeah. And of course, this doesn't make a lot of sense. If you ask me to predict where an arbitrarily new data, I give you a data set of oranges. You ask me to predict a data set of grapes uh, or, or new images that have grapes or do not have grapes in the, inside it, and that doesn't make any sense uh what and and so in machine learning we have uh, another fundamental assumption that the test data set which is also a bunch of images let's say it is also drawn from the marginal of uh, p of x of y uh, over um, y okay so it comes from the same distribution as the input images in the training data set and that is why you are able to say when or when you cannot uh, uh, predict well on this new data if the data set does not come from the same distribution then all bets are off it is very important to understand that uh, uh, this assumption underlies everything that we will ever do in machine learning it is equally important to understand that this is only an assumption 
and it essentially will never be true in practice. Uh, if you're a biologist uh, looking at some biological data, mm, things evolve quite differently uh, with time. If you are uh, even Google answering image search queries or uh, text search queries, the kind of stuff people search for changes by the day. If you're Netflix serving movies uh, to people, people watch different movies on different days of the week, uh, different months, even your taste change quite quickly. Uh, so the test distribution on which we want to make predictions correctly always evolves. And that is the root of all grief in machine learning. E, uh, machine learning is hard, even if the test distribution was uh, the same. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it is never the same. And that is what makes it really hard. Okay. So this is what we would like to do. We are searching for a predictor. We can also call it a model. Uh, we are searching for a model that generalizes well in the sense that it predicts well on new data, uh, but we only have the test uh, training data to check what it does. We do not have access to the new samples, so we can never make statements about the new samples other than doing some hacks uh, around how to use the training data. Set, okay, so this is really the root of the problem. Uh, another thing to appreciate is we are building a predictor or a model, uh, which I will denote as f of x. It is parameterized by some parameters w, just like our perceptron, uh, or just, just like the neuron in McCulloch and Pitt's model was parameterized by the weights w. Uh, the hash map that I talked about is a very complicated function. Hash maps are designed to be complicated. Uh, you can always find very complicated functions that fit your training data. Uh, doesn't matter even if your training data is very large. But then uh, the uh, the name of the uh, or, or the central problem here is that there is many complicated functions. As you increase the dimensionality of the weight space or the you know, parameters that parameters this function, you are required to search in a larger and larger space. And there are many many solutions. Uh, in this larger space. The larger the set of functions, the larger the number of solutions. And you will make mistakes in which solution you pick because all you have to check whether or not you have a solution is how well the function does on the training data. So the uh, abstract question in machine learning is to fit a model uh, to the training data set, but make sure that the model is not too rich. If the model is too rich, then we will make mistakes in picking elements from this very rich class and those uh, elements that we pick may not work well in the test data. So we should be as conservative as we can in selecting the size of this model. Uh, and we don't even get to check uh, how the model works on the test data because we don't have access to it. Okay. So in some sense, it seems a very, very ill-posed problem. Uh, I tell you that uh, uh, the true labels were created by some model, presumably, but you don't know the size of this model. Uh, I, uh, you, you are basically making guesses in the blind. Uh, I don't tell you the kind of problems that I will check you on in the future. Uh, so again, you do not know how the future will look like. Okay, And so uh, what we'll do is try to reason about this a little more carefully and then work under the right set of assumptions and uh, uh, constructions to make sure that this entire process is well defined. Questions? Okay. No, no questions. Uh, okay. So let's uh, uh, do uh, uh, um, a quick recap of linear regression. Everyone here has seen this, uh, I'm sure, uh, but this is just for notation. A linear regression model would be a function or a predictor that looks like this. It is uh, uh, It runs on X when you give it as an argument. It is a function of two parameters, uh, W and B, and it's an affine function. It is W transpose X plus the uh, bias B. W is called the uh, direction of the hyperplane, uh, and, and B is the bias of the hyperplane. If you want to think of a two-dimensional line, it would be the intercept, and W would be the slope. Okay. Uh, in pictures, it will look a little bit like this. If X is two-dimensional, uh, X1 and X2, uh, this is the output Y that you're regressing. This is no longer a classification problem. We are trying to predict a real-valued thing. Y is real-valued here. Uh, you would fit a hyperplane that uh, that minimizes the distance of the red points to the hyperplane. This is how well 
uh, for this particular input, this is what you predict. This is what the true output is in your data set. And your, your goal is to fit a hyperplane or select a hyperplane from among all possible hyperplanes that minimize the length of this vertical arrows. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Uh, we would like to predict on average over all the samples or all the samples in the training data set. So we can write down an objective function that looks like this. It's an objective function that tells us how can we find the best W and B. Uh, what do we use to measure when a W and B is good? Well, we look at the true outputs that I have in my training data set, uh, the red points here. Uh, we check them against the predictions that the model makes, which is uh, which is what I denote by W hat I, which is the prediction of the model on the ith sample. And you may use some reasonable way to measure this discrepancy between the two. In this case, I'm using the squared uh, loss. And I'm also calculating the average of this loss over all the samples in my training data set, which tells me that I'm not interested in the maximum error or the uh, quantile error, but I'm interested in one specific one, which is the average error. Yeah. At the end of the day, we would like to find uh, weights and biases that minimize such loss functions. And that is what uh, that is why we'll use tools in optimization. Uh, we This loss function uh, will be uh, is a quadratic loss. So we know a closed form answer. You, have, you will recognize this expression from uh, some time ago, uh, from high school maybe. Uh, but the uh, loss function that we will use in deep learning will be a bit more complicated. And that is, uh, but the problems on an abstract sense will look exactly like this. Yeah. You know uh, that you can also set up polynomial regression using the same formula for linear regression by creating features that are one x, x square, x cube, all the monomial terms. Uh, uh, if you have one dimensional data, if you have multi dimensional data, you will get multi dimensional uh, terms like this. Uh, and uh, to give you an example, uh, it will look a bit like this. So if the true function that nature created its outputs was uh, the green line, so this is a one dimensional polynomial or it's a sinusoid to be specific, uh, the data set that you had are these uh, blue points. Uh, depending on what model you fit, you may get different kinds of answers. This is a model that is simply a constant. So W0 bias is something that you choose to minimize the errors on average, and that would fit the bias to some value here. If you use a more complicated, if you fit a linear regression model, you will uh, try to match the points this way. And of course, both of these models have a lot of errors. The blue points don't lie on the red line at all. If you use a more complicated model, in this case, this is a ninth order polynomial, then you will fit the blue points. But now you see the issue uh, with this business. As far as you can measure, you can only measure the function, the red function at the blue points. You have done your job perfectly. You fit them perfectly. You have zero residuals. You have zero error on the training data set. But what the red function does on stuff that is not a part of the training data set is very different from the green line. And this is exactly what it means to do to not do well on the test data set. Test samples are being are going to be different from the blue circles. Uh, you will see a discrepancy in what the red function predicts and what the green function predicts on the test samples. And we would like to avoid such kinds of situations. We are slightly happier to have situations that look a little bit like this, where we may let go some points, but we capture the uh, uh, trend uh, a little better. And uh, that way we make slightly fewer errors on the te uh, test samples. Okay, it is not very easy to understand whether you are living in this world or whether you are living in this world. Uh, just because we only have the blue points to measure things by. In terms of the blue points, this, actually, this is actually a worse model than this one. Okay, so let us look at our first neural network. It will be a very simple neural network. It is something called as the perceptron. It is exactly what Frank Rosenblatt did. Uh, it's a linear model, W transpose X. You apply sine function to convert it into a classifier. So if W transpose X is greater than zero, this function predicts a plus one. If it is less than zero, it predicts a minus one. Okay. And now you would like to ask yourself, how do I fit this model? How do I fit a perceptron? For regression, we know that we can minimize the squared error across all the samples and the mean squared error. 
for classification, uh, this is a quantity that you would like to minimize. So these are the true labels. If your function, uh, if your predictor does not predict the same thing as a true label, then, then you penalize it. Uh, by a unit value, and you are trying to minimize the average number of mistakes over your n samples, your n samples, and this would be some number between zero and one. That is what you are trying to minimize. This is the zero one loss. Okay. Uh, the problem with this kind of thinking, the problem with the zero one loss specifically, is that it is not differentiable. Uh, this is an indicator of the, whether these two things match or do not match, and we cannot really use gradient based methods that are very powerful in optimization theory to under to understand how to tweak the weights w uh, to fit to minimize this loss for linear regression there was no such uh, problem we could solve the problem in closed form analytically if you wanted to do gradient descent on this we could have done gradient descent just fine here there is no gradient and that is why we cannot use gradient based techniques and that is why we cook up losses that are proxies of this loss so zero one loss is what we really want to minimize we cannot, but then we can define different kinds of proxies. So here is one. It is something called as the hinge loss. And I will draw the hinge loss on this face. And I will draw it in this uh, slightly funny way. Uh, so I will draw y times w transpose x. And the reason I'm drawing this is that if w transpose x and y have the same sign in the sense that if it is positive, then I'm making good predictions because when I apply the sign function to w transpose x, I will get the same thing as y. So every everything here is stuff where the model predicts correctly on this input x for this output y. Okay, if this is the ground product. And so we will draw the loss here. The hinge loss is the maximum of minus uh, zero and minus uh, y times uh, w transpose x. And so it will look a little bit like this. Okay, uh, this is at the origin. Uh, you can think of different losses. Uh, the zero one loss will look uh, a little bit like this. Uh, this will be one. Uh, it will be so you'll get a you will get a penalty of one for this particular sample. If W transpose X and Y do not match in sign, if they do match in sign, then you do not get any penalty. So that is the zero one loss. This would be the hinge loss. And there are many different losses that people use. So this is something called as the exponential loss, which is e to the negative y times w transpose x. Again, it will look uh, it is z, uh, it is one when uh, w is uh, when y times w transpose x is zero. So it will look a little bit like this. And there are there are many many other losses like this. Okay, so the uh, name of the game now is to set up a parametric form for the model. And we have used one particular parametric form, uh, namely a linear function uh, with some nonlinearity at the top to convert it into classifier and use a chosen surrogate loss uh, to uh, figure out which uh, weights or which biases are the correct one. Okay, I will ignore the biases in everything that we do. Uh, you can think of it as uh, W transpose X plus B is equivalent to some other W transpose times uh, a different vector where I append uh, one to an X. Uh, and uh, that is why I will not worry about uh, the biases. I'll always write, I assume that I've appended my inputs and uh, do not have to worry about them. Okay. Let us now think of one way to minimize things or let, uh, to fit things. Uh, and we are going to use a very simple algorithm. Uh, think of uh, the hinge loss. The hinge loss is the maximum of mm, zero and minus y times w transpose x. If I am here, if I have weights that give me a penalty, that give me a loss, that give me an error, then by moving in this direction, which is the direction of the negative gradient, I improve my performance on the model. So I, re I reduce the amount of penalty that I get if I move to the right. If I am over here, I don't need to move anywhere because I'm already making the correct prediction on that sample. Okay. So the gradient of the hinge loss is simply with respect to W is minus Y times X. This is a vector, the same dimension as W. If W is a hundred dimensional vector, uh, minus y times x is also 100 dimensional because x is 100 dimensional. Uh, 
and uh, we are going to use a gradient like this to move. Okay, you are going to move in the direction of the negative gradient, which is equal to y times x, and keep iterating over this uh, to fit this model. And this is what is called the famous perceptron algorithm. People uh, knew it back in the early 60s or the late 50s. And it works as follows. So we are going to take our data set at each iteration. Let's, let's say that we are at the teeth iteration right now. We're going to sample a datum with an index omega t. Omega t is an index that lies between 1 and n. And so when I say I'm going to sample a data, a datum, I'm going to put a uniform uh, probability mass function from uh, on elements one to n, and I'm going to sample a random uh, var uh, variable, which is the index from this distribution. Uh, and let us say that we sample this particular datum, x omega t and y omega t. We are going to update the weights uh, to improve the loss on this particular datum if we are making a mistake on this data. If you do not make a mistake on this datum, then the weights stay the same. And you can do this uh, for many, many iterations. What, what, what is going to happen if you have samples that are, let's say, plus ones over here, these are minus ones over here. When you fit a perceptron, you are finding a hyperplane. So if your hyperplane begins with something like this, you sample this image, let us say everything uh, to the right of the hyperplane or everything to the left of the hyperplane is plus one, everything to the right of the hyperplane is, is denoted, is predicted to be minus one when you apply the sign function. If you happen to sample this point, we will update the weights to classify this point a tiny bit better. So this hyperplane will be moved to, uh, fit the point a tiny bit better, this particular point a tiny bit better. It need not always directly move to uh, this space where we perfectly classify the point, but it will definitely make it better, okay? So now given that you are at this location in your second, after your first iteration, you will sample another point randomly. This one is also making a mistake. And so you will move the hyperplane a tiny bit further in to classify this point, okay? And you can do this forever. Uh, but does this process always stop? Well, it doesn't have to. Uh, if the data set is uh, something that you cannot classify like the XOR data set, then you know that no matter which hyperplane you predict, you couldn't possibly have exactly zero error. So you will keep on changing your hyperplane by tiny and tiny amounts until uh, you uh, and never stop. But it is it, you can show very easily that uh, if the data set is actually something that can be uh, classified cleanly uh, by some hyperplane, then this algorithm uh, to iteratively modify the hyperplane to fit successively newer samples or successive samples in the data set will find the solution. It may not find the, uh, the, the solution need not be unique. So in this case, there are indeed two hyperplanes or many to be precise that will all cleanly divide the data set. And so this algorithm will find one of them depending on where you initialize the weights W, uh, but you will get a solution. So the perceptron algorithm works when you uh, have linearly separable data sets. These are linearly separable data sets and it need not converge if the data set is not linearly separable like so, yeah. Uh, this is a short proof of when the perceptron algorithm works. Um, but what I want to end this section with is that we have seen a very powerful way of fitting models. Uh, this is something called as stochastic gradient descent. And I, I showed it to you without actually saying the words. Uh, this algorithm is called stochastic gradient descent for the hinge loss. So mathematically now, and this is a very old algorithm, uh, it was discovered in the early 50s uh, uh, in the uh, operations research literature. Uh, and the perceptron algorithm is simply one particular instantiation of SGD. SGD is what we are going to use a lot in the following lectures. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about it enough for you to get bored by it. Uh, um, uh, but in, an, in, in, a, in a crisp sense, it will look a bit like this. These are our training data points. We would like to minimize some loss for our particular uh, model of the uh, labels uh, on these data points. So L superscript I, I will denote to be the penalty that you get for having make, uh, made incorrect predictions on the ith datum in your training data set. W are your weights. 
and your job is to find the best to weights W that minimize the average loss over the entire data set. At each iteration, we are going to update the weights WT plus one to be the old weights WT minus the gradient, which is the gradient calculated on some randomly chosen input datum in your data set uh, with respect to W and a coefficient. This coefficient will tell us how much we move in the direction of the negative gradient. You can imagine that if you move a little bit uh, 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 slowly, then you do not overshoot uh, locations that you may wish to find. If this is your loss, you want to find the smallest thing, uh, value of the loss in your domain. If you take a very large step with the gradient, then you may end up on this part, okay? And that is why you would like to use a step size. This is something that you choose uh, uh, using the data set, the best step size, and we'll see some ways of choosing this properly. But in 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 clips, uh, uh, in succinctly, this is stochastic gradient descent, where at where each iteration you are sampling an input datum and updating the weights in the direction of the negative gradient. Uh, this input datum is sampled uniformly over the treating data set, and that is that is quite important. Yeah. Um, we'll use this kind of notation uh, instead of carrying around this big gradients. Uh, and, and there is nothing more here. It is the gradient assembly vector, the size of the same, same size as the number of weights. And we are going to update the weights using the data. Okay. Any questions? No, no questions. Cool. So before we proceed, um, I will uh, um, talk about one particular uh, representation of the weights of a perceptron. We know that uh, the uh, weights of a perceptron, uh, so pardon my omegas and uh, let us call them omega uh, bars. Uh, the weights of the perceptron are updated this way if you're making mistakes on that particular sample, right? So in a sense, the weights, are always a linear combination of all the mistakes that you are making on the training data set. So you can rewrite the weights at the end of training. If I do T iterations of this weight update business, I can rewrite the weights in a slightly different way and say, if I have alpha I is the number of mistakes that I made while fitting on a data set on the ith datum. Remember that the hyperplane keeps on moving across many iterations and what was a correctly labeled sample first according to our model may be incorrect later and then the model try to fix it because it will sample that point at some later iteration but after you choose to stop or after the perceptron algorithm converges uh, let alpha i be the number of mistakes that you make on the uh, the ith datum this can be zero if you never made a mistake while fitting the data set on that datum not just at the end but during the course of training uh, or it could be some other value, okay? So the final weights are some linear combination of these uh, dual variables. They are called times y times i, which is directly coming from this additive term here, plus whatever your weight initialization was. And if you think of your weights uh, to be initialized simply at zero, uh, then you can write down the final solution in this slightly less useful sense uh, like this, because it's not as if you know the values of alpha i's uh, before you train. So it is not a closed form answer for what W star is, but it's a very powerful way to think about what W star is. Okay, it's a linear combination of the inputs and the outputs uh, of uh, all your training data points. And uh, the function that we are after, which is the sign of uh, uh, y hat, where y hat was uh, equal to W transpose x uh, at this point. Uh, if we replace it, rewrite re w as the summation or the, at the average of y i x i uh, uh, over these weights alpha i and then you will be able to write the output like this now the interesting thing to note here is that the function that we have built to predict on images x is a very peculiar function it's a convex combination of outer products of the test datum X with respect to all training data points. So roughly speaking, this inner product uh, between X I, which is one of your training data points and X, which is your test data point uh, is 
checking how similar an X is to one particular XI. If these two are similar, then I upweigh the, their contribution in this summation. And if they're dissimilar, I downweigh their contribution in the summation. In this very uh, precise sense, the perceptron is uh, checking uh, for local similarities between the inputs in with respect to the data set, and then using the outputs of those points cleverly, combining them cleverly to make the prediction, okay? So it is not, do we, we can think of it in terms of predicting a hyperplane and so, but you can also think in, uh, of it in terms of some local interpolation of your uh, input data points, okay? This particular pattern, which is uh, X tran XI transpose X, the similarity or the inner product between the two is uh, very special. And you will see it many, many times uh, when you do machine learning. Uh, and that is why people gave it a name. Uh, this is something called as a kernel machine. Uh, but first, before we get to that, <laughs> let us think of how to use a linear model to create a non-linear model, okay? So we know how to fit a linear model. All you have to do is write down a hinge loss uh, uh, for classification and then take uh, run stochastic and descent to fit this model. Uh, and let us see if we can make it a tiny, tiny bit richer, uh, no more nonlinear. Uh, linear models may make some mistakes. So if these are the red points and these are the blue points, then all the ones that are marked uh, uh, blue, uh, the, these red points will be misclassified. Uh, these blue points will be misclassified. Um, the concept of a feature space or the concept of a kernel that, uh, that corresponds to a feature space is to take the points X and then map it to some other space. Just like when we did polynomial regression, we took the polynomial, which was like this, and then created features that were one X X squared. And this was your new future uh, feature. And then now you did this, uh, now you fitted weights in a, using a linear model for this new feature set to fit a polynomial uh, to this function. You can play the same game uh, with more generality. So instead of creating monomial features, you could create some arbitrary map, uh, let us call it phi, between your original inputs x and your new inputs, which are phi of x. Every input in your training data set is mapped to a new input, phi of x. And now the data set that we have is effectively a phi of uh, x uh, and y. Uh, and this is the one that we're trying to classify, okay? Uh, this is how a nonlinear map would look. This is an exponential kernel applied, uh, a radial basis function kernel applied to uh, these data points. And you will notice that the kernel or, 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 the, or the model is still linear in the features. So you're still fitting exactly this model, sine of W transpose P of X. But now because P is a nonlinear function of the inputs X, the effective decision boundary that you get for the model, the stuff that demarcates the positive points and the negative points is not linear anymore. It is a little bit richer. You will be able to classify more complicated data sets using these functions. In particular, the XOR data set that we saw the one that linear functions could not classify, we can imagine trying to classify it with this model. Any guesses as to what feature we would use to classify this? Let us say that this is the origin. And these are our X1 and X2. This is a two dimensional data set. These are four points uh, where, every, uh, where the quadrants define what uh, uh, points you get. What feature phi would you use to classify this correctly? using a linear model. You can use polar coordinates for those of you who are thinking. Okay. So now the, uh, you can, uh, as we said, this is, if this is our data set, then fitting the model to this data set is the same thing. Again, we are doing stochastic gradient descent. Uh, where we pick an image or uh, uh, pick an input where the model makes a mistake upon. Uh, and instead of doing y times x as the gradient, y times x as the gradient, we now do y times p of x. Okay. That is the gradient that is being used to update the model. Just like the weights were uh, combinations of yi, xi, weighted by alpha i, the dual variables before, 
now their combinations y i t of x i weighted by the dual variables alpha I. okay just like making the prediction was using inner products of x i transpose times x before where x is the test datum now you are using inner products of phi of x i times phi of x so nothing has changed uh, in principle uh, uh, but now we have a somehow a more powerful way of fitting functions. Before this, we could only fit hyperplanes. Now we can fit uh, more nonlinear functions. Uh, the, it is important to realize that this is not just, uh, uh, it may seem like a cheap trick, right? Uh, you are still fitting a linear model, but now you can fit any data set uh, with, uh, and just pretend that it is a linear model of this data set, but in some uh, feature space. Of course, the problem of the pro uh, the issue of the problem being complicated or the data set being complicated doesn't entirely go away. Uh, you know uh, that if you want to fit a function in high dimensions, then you will have to pinch the function down at many, many points uh, that are exponential in uh, the dimensionality of the function, the support of the uh, dimension the support of the function. Um, and this is what is called as a curve subdimensionality. So just because we throw the, our input images X into a higher dimensional space, the one dimensional polynomial was being thrown into a larger space with the terms being the monomials, uh, doesn't mean that we can do machine learning well. Uh, we can fit the function well, but in order to find a true function, the true nonlinear function, we still have to get more data. If the feature space in which you throw stuff in is large, then you will also have to get requisitely large amounts of data. And uh, that is why the concept of a feature space, even if it allows us to find one class of functions that fit well, is not just the end of machine learning. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that you can always do uh, fit complicated data using simply linear models. Okay. That brings us to the concept of a kernel. So as you can imagine, if you want to run this predictor uh, uh, with, with an expression like this, then every single time someone gives you a test datum, you're first going to compute this function phi of x. Uh, uh, presumably you have pre-computed all the functions phi of x i for all your training samples, calculate this entire summation, and then uh, give you the, and, and then output the predictions y hat, right? This is a uh, expensive thing to do at inference time because uh, if you think about this uh, now, presumably uh, Google image search is using a neural network or even Facebook is using a neural network to check whether two images are the same. But in the early 2010s, these are the kind of models that were being used to essentially serve search queries and check the similarity between high dimension and images. Okay. And this summation becomes complicated because it explodes linearly in the number of training data points. If you have a risk data set, you have lots of training data points, you have to do a lot of work at inference time. Uh, that makes it complicated. And these vectors can also be quite high dimensional. So phi for typical images uh, that people used to use in the 2000s will be a few uh, thousand dimensions. And that those, these inner products uh, quickly get very uh, expensive. Yeah. Uh, kernels are a way to think about this. Uh, kernels are simply a name given to the inner product between two features uh, of two input points, x, i, and x. And uh, uh, this is, let's say, a polynomial kernel. Uh, uh, it, will take, uh, uh, it will take quadratic features. So if you have an input datum x, which is a real number, uh, it will create a feature which is a three-dimensional quantity now. So you're solving a different classification problem where the inputs are three-dimensional and the outputs are one-dimensional again, but now you can fit quadratic functions. Uh, the outer product between V of X uh, or the inner, sorry, the inner product between V of X and V of X prime, uh, if you write it down, you will see that it is some function. In this case, one plus X times X transpose squared. Again, this function measures the similarity between x and x transpose, uh, uh, x and x prime. Okay, if x and x prime are very different from each other, then this entire number is very large. Remember that x and x prime are real numbers. Uh, so if they're very different from each other, they're far away from each other on the real line, and the kernel will be quite large between them. 
if they're close to each other, uh, if they're identical, in fact, it will be one. So kernels are simply functions uh, that are functions of two things, x and x, uh, uh, x cross x, uh, that return a real number, that, uh, and that measure the similarity between two things, just like this inner product measures similarity. <clears throat> And they have different names. So if you are uh, um, uh, if you are working uh, if you're trying to find quadratic features of high dimen uh, higher dimensional vectors, you can write down a kernel that looks like this. Again, it measures similarity between x and x prime. Uh, x prime. This is the radial basis function kernel, which is again, as you can see, measuring the discrepancy between x and x prime. Okay. Now. The perceptron, we can again now write down, we know that it is simply SGD for uh, uh, the uh, for uh, Hinge loss. We can again write it down simply as uh, updating the weights or updating the dual variables alpha i. Every time you make a mistake, you update, you increase the value of alpha i by one for that particular input datum. How do you check whether you make a mistake? Well, you check the sign of y and your prediction for that particular sample. And you will notice that these are all the features of your uh, uh, images in the training data set. These are the features of the images also in the training data set because x omega t during training is one of the inputs of your training data set, right? At inference time, it's a different thing, but for training, it is simply one of the elements of your training data set. So you can create this large matrix, which is k of x i comma x j, uh, whose size is number of samples times number of samples. And uh, you can simply read off elements of this matrix to check whether or not you have made a mistake. Okay, So this model is called a kernel perceptron, and it is simply a way of fitting a nonlinear perceptron. Uh, it is still a linear model, but in this large feature space. Okay. Now let us write down uh, so how much more time do I have? But maybe about... Uh, so just 10, 10 minutes, then okay. Okay. Yeah. 12. Okay. Yeah. So now let us write down a slightly different kind of kernel, okay? We said uh, we were very uh, uh, ambiguous about what this function phi of x is, and we are going to now take a specific form uh, of for phi of x. We are going to say that uh, I would like to pick a fee that takes in my input X, uses some matrix S and some nonlinear function sigma to write it down. This is simply a choice. It doesn't mean that it's a good choice. It is simply a choice. Okay. Uh, so sigma is the nonlinearity, S is the matrix, and X is a vector. This is also a big vector. Uh, if x is a vector, so let's say that if x lies in d dimensions, then the features that you create, which is equal to phi of x, uh, lie in p different dimensions. And now you can ask yourself, okay, uh, I want my function phi to be something that I know how to compute. How do I choose s and how do I choose sigma? As I said, there are many choices for these uh, two things. Uh, people in the past have experimented with things that are uh, like random features where they will say that I will choose sigma to be, let's say, uh, uh, a sigmoid. A sigmoid is simply a function which is uh, one plus e to the negative minus x. So it's a, it's a function that acts on real numbers and returns a real number in return. But they will choose features of the kind uh, s, which is a big matrix of size, uh, let's say, uh, D dimension, D columns, uh, P rows, every element of S is a draw from a random uh, distrib uh, dis uh, from a distribution. So S is a random matrix uh, which multiplies your inputs X, X, and then sigma acts upon all the elements of the uh, result, which is a large vector, and simply uh, runs them like this. So sigma is a function that looks a little bit like this. It is zero as you go off to negative infinity, as you go off to positive infinity, it is one. And so uh, this is one particular way of creating a feature. Uh, just like we created features using polynomials uh, for fitting a, a quadratic uh, kernel uh, or quadratic features, uh, we uh, 
can think of this as some other feature space that corresponds to some kernel, the kernel being simply P of X transpose times uh, P of X prime, okay? Uh, a random matrix S is great, and you will see some examples of how uh, people have used such random matrices. Uh, again, you can do the same kind of business, uh, just like you had W transpose phi of X as our model. Now you have uh, W transpose sigma times S transpose X uh, that goes in. F is not only a function of W because S is simply some a matrix that we choose a priori before we begin training and freeze it to that value. So S is not a parameter any, uh, yet. Okay. So this is the predictor. It is still a linear predictor in this feature space. The feature space simply happens to be something that has this form. Again, you can minimize the loss over your uh, data set uh, for this particular chosen function, okay? And you can read this very beautiful paper called uh, uh, that developed these random features, which were quite popular in the mid 2000s for problems ranging from text uh, to speech, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they showed that for shift invariant kernels, you can use uh, sigma to be a cosine nonlinearity and with S being a random matrix. And that has certain nice approximation properties in the Fourier space. Okay, so uh, we have talked about kernels. The reason we talked about kernels is because we had a linear model and we wanted to secretly make it a nonlinear model, but still fit only the linear function. Uh, we have talk, uh, talked about how to choose a particular kind of feature, uh, this kind of feature. And then now I'm going to simply uh, change the game a tiny bit and say, look, I'm not interested in selecting S to be a random matrix. I will select S to be a parameter itself. And that will be our first neural network. Okay. So we are going to learn this feature matrix, uh, which is S, uh, in addition to the weights W. Okay. The reason for doing this is that uh, we can always cook up this uh, um, large feature uh, large feature space, but because S is frozen to be a fixed matrix, uh, it doesn't give you the ability to, uh, it doesn't give us the ability to adapt this feature space to the particular data set. Uh, what features are good for images may be quite different for the features that are good for text, may be quite different for the features that are good for images taken at night versus images of handwritten digits. Uh, and different data sets would like certain different features, just like if you're fitting data from polynomial, you know that you should use polynomial features instead of, let's say, sinusoids, and that will make your life a tiny bit better. Uh, the ability to uh, the, the, or, or writing our predictor f as a function of both w and s allows us the freedom to choose s in different ways instead of simply freezing it. The problem has changed quite dramatically uh, by just doing so. It is now a function. Uh, we are now trying to find two uh, parameters, w and s, that minimize the average error across the training data set. The loss doesn't change too much, but now it's a function of both W and S. And there is a few things that uh, that are important to appreciate just by this uh, small choice. Before this, we said that it was fitting a linear function. Uh, now we cannot say that anymore. It is a nonlinear function because W and S interact multiplicatively. Even if sigma were identity, they would still interact multiplicatively with each other. Okay, so it's a non-linear function of the bits now. It is no longer a linear function. It may also be a large function. So before this, we were only interested in finding W star. Now we are interested in finding W star and S star. S star can be a large matrix. Let's say the D dimensional inputs and P weights. This was finding only the P weights plus a bias maybe. And this is finding P cross D weights and plus maybe a bias if you wish. Okay, so depending on what P and D are, this one is much larger than this. And this is why it may also be a slightly larger problem. Uh, I say high dimension here in general, but it is a larger problem for sure. Yeah, uh, the most important thing to appreciate about this is that 
while the hinge loss uh, was a convex function, the hinge loss is simply max of zero y times w tra uh, transpose x. This is the convex function of w. Uh, the new loss is not a convex function of W and S because they interact with each other multiplicatively. So non-convex optimization problems are much harder than convex optimization problems. So roughly speaking, convex optimization problems look like a parabola and that you're trying to descend down into and find the smallest value that a parabola takes. Non-convex problems can look like this. If you begin here, then descending down will give you a solution that does not have as good error as some other location. If you begin here, everything is nice, um, but if you begin even here, then you will reach a bad location. And this is an instance where you will not even fit the training data set correct. Yeah. So gradient-based optimization of non-convex objectives is much harder than gradient-based optimization of convex objectives. And that is why by simply making this one ch little choice, we have increased the ability to fine tune the features to the data set. We don't have to pick them by hand. Uh, the training process will automatically pick a good value of S, but we have made our life much harder because now we are solving a much harder optimization problem. Okay, it's a nonlinear, high dimensional, uh, non convex optimization problem. And such problems are very challenging. But uh, this is a two-layer neural network, and that is our first uh, view into what a neural network is. Uh, a two-layer neural network is simply something that uses this specific form for the features of the so-called first layer, combines them using a linear function, W transpose the features for the second layer, and then predicts an output, and that's it, okay? Uh, a deep neural network, uh, I will change the notation because I want to use W for something else later. A deep neural network is simply a function where you do this business many, many times. Instead of having the V transpose your features, which was which is what we did in the previous section, uh, you will do V transpose these kinds of features. You take the first layer's features, you again multiply them by another matrix S2, you again multiply it by another matrix S3, and you keep doing this for a few times until you have now a predictor that depends on V. It depends on S1 all the way up to SL if you have L plus one layers, okay? So this is a deep neural network. It is not a very complicated object. It just looks complicated written like this, but this is the only kind of expression you can write. There is not much else you can do to this expression itself. Um, it is a very natural extension of a kernel perceptron. A kernel perceptron was written so that we have the ability to define more fancy, fancy features than just uh, an affine function of the inputs. Uh, this is a, a feature that is that allows us, gives us the ability to tune the features to the data set. Okay, so a deep network, in simple words, creates new features by composing together old features. These are the old features, and these are the new features that are being used uh, 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 to uh, fit the function later. Okay, this combination of old features will be quite powerful and it will uh, give us very different kinds of features than what linear models can typically learn. And this is really where the true power of deep learning comes in, uh, the ability to learn features that are specific to the data sets that we are dealing with. Yeah. So I will stop here for today, and then uh, tomorrow we'll look at uh, uh, some more uh, uh, jargon around deep learning and go closer towards understanding uh, or trying to uh, formalize uh, the key questions in deep learning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Yeah. Uh, let me know if you have questions. Feel free to send me an email. Okay. So. Other I'm sorry, I missed a few questions in the chat. Maybe I can answer them now. Yes, please. Yeah, so I would like to know if it is actually possible to investigate the dynamical system of a biological system using deep learning, and how does deep learning take into account nonlinearity? So uh, this is very true. So you can think of uh, investigating the behavior of a dynamical system using deep learning. Uh, 
uh, uh, we can certainly make predictions on uh, outputs of, bi of biological systems, uh, whether it is a time, way, uh, whether it is a function of time or not, that is just a way uh, the, the models that we will use uh, will be different for such things. In the third lecture, we will look at some pretty cool ideas of how these models behave, of how models of biological systems behave in general. Uh, and that is very similar somehow to how neural networks also learn. Uh, okay. uh, why is it that the test data is unknown? Shouldn't we split data prior to model fitting? You can split your data in any, any way you want. The problem is that after you have done whatever you want to fit the model, someone will run it on a real problem. That is unknown. So what data will be fed to the new model? That is what I would like to call as test data. That is unknown. The training data set, you can certify it using many different ways that people will call it cross-validation. Uh, and that is simply our way of fitting the model. Okay, That doesn't change the fact that we don't know the test data. Uh, cool. Thank you so much. Uh, I will see you tomorrow, same time. Uh, okay. Yeah. Are there any questions in the audience? No? Okay. If that's the case, thank you. Thank you very much, Pratik. See you tomorrow at uh, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, uh, CET time. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.